Welcome to my Cisco Scaling Networks with the third installment of the CCNA material. This is chapter four, Wireless LANs. So I'm not going to lie, I honestly, I believe that this chapter was one of those add-in chapters because they wanted filler. Because when we're looking at the overall structure of scaling networks, at least in this particular placement, we did uh, basic switching, we did... Uh, switch port redundancy, STP, ether channel, and right after ether channel, we're going into wireless LANs, which I mean, if you think of it, is a way to extend the LAN. So we're going to be looking at LAN concepts, operation, security, and configuration. And this is actually going to be the finished portion of our LAN discussion, at least at the scaling network side. Uh, after this chapter, we're going into more routing protocols, back to OSPF, back to EIGRP, and we're going to end with licensing. Each of the uh, routing protocols have two chapters, so this material only has nine chapters total. So let's look at the objectives. Our goal here is to basically talk about wireless technologies and standards, make sure you understand the components that make up a wireless network, and the LAN infrastructure, wireless topologies, the frame structure, threats to wireless, uh, what they do for security mechanisms, things of that nature. Um, while this is a Cisco course, I may bring in outside material that is not Cisco, just because I want to make sure that we see some of the stuff that's current out there. All right, first one is the wireless concepts. So one of the problems is we're no longer tied to a fixed location. Being tied down via a wire makes things hard. We're in the mo mobility age, and that means we have to have uh, the ability to go without wires, one. Two, we have more and more mobile devices that are getting away from a traditional desktop or a traditional PC. We want to be able to be mobile. You're no longer sitting at a desk doing your work. We want to be having the ability to go everywhere, work on any type of device. Benefits of wireless definitely increases productivity. If you're able to work on the go, you can work anywhere. You want to do work at Starbucks? Sure. You want to be able to work at the airport? Sure. You want to be able to work in the backseat of a taxi? Again, you can. That increased productivity is due to the increased flexibility of the work. A wireless, sometimes it is called, it says it reduces costs, but I'm sorry, sometimes the wireless is damn expensive, so the whole reduction of cost may or may not always be uh, there. But it is scalable, meaning the ability to grow and to adapt is definitely there, and that's going to be one of the big things. So let's talk about some technologies. We have a wireless personal LAN, uh, WPAN. It's going to be something similar to a PAN, but wireless. That's going to be, you know, a few feet within a person. Bluetooth, uh, things like that. Wireless LAN. Again, it's going to be a LAN that's wireless. Wireless WAN. Again, it's going to be a WAN that's wireless. We have two other key terms. Bluetooth which is also IEEE 802.15, which is, again, a wireless PAN standard. Uh, pretty common uh, Bluetooth headsets, Bluetooth connections to your car from your phone. So Bluetooth has been pretty up there. Uh, normally, you're talking fairly close, but how close depends on the standard. Roughly up to 100 uh, meters. That's kind of subjective. Honestly, I think more of a within the same room. We also have what's called Wi-Fi wireless, which is an 802.11 standard. And that goes up to, again, the range varies. Uh, further away from the access point, the slower the wireless gets. Four of our later technologies that are more popular now, WiMAX. So you take that microwave that we used to do analog TV on, convert that to wireless, bam, you got WiMAX. And that is 802.16. That's more of a wireless WAN technology. 
Sometimes I've seen this also defined as a wireless LAN technology, but again, it's going to depend on who you talk to. Satellite and cellular broadband, again, depending on where you get the broadband, is it coming from a cell, uh, cellular tower, satellite, both? Those are our last two major technologies. So let's look at radio frequencies. We're looking at specifically radio waves, and that goes between 3 kilohertz and 300 gigahertz. And again, all of them have a very specific uh, item. For example, you're in your car and you're listening to 102.7 megahertz. Well, 102 point, that's going to be in the FH band or the UHF band. It's going to be right here in, in between those two. So depending on how you're transmitting will depend on which frequencies you're using. Notice here, these are more microwave frequencies. So above 300 megahertz. If we're looking at 102 megahertz, we're right here. So typical radio is VHF. If you're talking radio frequencies, like a, a radio, like a medic or a police radio, we're probably getting more into the ultra high frequencies. So now that we understand frequencies to a degree, now that we understand certain standards, let's go back to our Wi-Fi standards. Okay, this is going to be the big one. We have a development within wireless. We had the traditional 802.11, and that was really slow. It has 2 megabits. We had A, then B, then G, then N. Currently, we're using AC. And we have AD, which is still a draft. So when you take wireless exams, you have to know this chart pretty good. You have to know if they say, well, I want to be able to get 54 megabits a second using the 2.4 gigahertz band. I'm going to be using which wireless technology? Well, you'd be looking at either A or G. But because we're dealing with a very specific frequency, we said 2.4, that means it would have to be going with the G band. So again, you have to know the speed and the frequencies and the correlating IEEE standard. Again, right now, AC and its variations, that is actually our, our current standard. And this hole, it only operates at 5 gigahertz. Uh, again, it depends on the access point. I've seen several that operate both the 2.4 and 5. An example would be, uh, I'm looking at a Ubiquiti MIMO router. It's an 802.ac. It is that model number. But what I thought was very interesting is the integration and independency of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Basically, what it allows you to do is it actually allows you to do multiple connections to multiple devices simultaneously without having to worry about it. Here's the big thing. When you have traditional wireless, the access point allows for communication with one device at a time. But again, this is so quick that we don't realize it. You have newer and newer devices that are increasing its capacity and adding more users. If we have one access point that's not using this technology and it connects to 50 users, you're going to start seeing a slowdown because, again, the access point's a one-to-one. -one. So you may have 50 users connecting to it, but it's only processing data from one user at a time, as opposed to newer technologies, multi-user, multi-input, multi-output type technologies that allow it to communicate with both. All right, one last thing before we, we move away from this. It's not so much about this product. It's about understanding how the bands really work. When you have a single input output, that's typically your bandwidth. When you have the ability to separate the controls for input output, you actually end up with greater speeds. Lastly, 
this is something that I've made mistakes on in the past. How are we powering it? There are two common PoE, power over Ethernet, type of standards. Well, three actually. We have a, a proprietary Cisco one, which has been abandoned. We have 802.3AF and 802.3AT PoE standards. They power different units. So if you're planning on doing wireless deployments, make sure you're getting the correct power for the devices. I normally show you Cisco ones, but Cisco has such a, a breadth in wireless. I wanted just something that I could quickly show you and not go too far in depth. All right, so we have different Wi-Fi certifications. Wi-Fi Alliance is typically what you'd call wireless or Wi-Fi products. Again, 802.11b, G, and AC, AD compatible. They tell you if they work or not. Next, we have the appropriate types of security. WPA2, uh, for example, or WPS. We also have things like Wi-Fi passports or Maricast. Those are different certifications that verify certain technologies work. For example, the Maricast, it allows you to seamlessly display video between devices. Comparing uh, wireless lands to lands, again, the media, one's radio waves or radio frequencies, one uh, the physical cable. Media access, we use collision avoidance in wireless lands as opposed to collision detection. Availability, again, wired versus wireless. Um, wireless is susceptible to wireless noise. Regulations, it's going to change country to country, where typically wired connections, it's an international IEEE standard, so wired connections don't really change that often. Wireless NICs, just like a regular NIC, can be small, and they allow you access to a wireless network. A wireless home router is going to be a router with an access point built into it because we connect wirelessly to a wireless access point and that access point gives us access to the wireless network or to a wired network. Here we have our traditional infrastructure and we're connecting a access point to our access switch, thus allowing us to expand that access point to include wireless devices. We have different types of access points. We actually have a autonomous access point, meaning it works by itself, or we have a controller-based access point, meaning there's a wireless controller there. A lot of Cisco devices, there has to be a wireless controller, and that controls the configurations for all of the access points. Big reason for that is honestly, when you have thousands of access points working together or hundreds of access points working together, you want dedicated hardware that's going to verify that those access points are truly working together. So you also have the ability to do smaller deployments uh, with the small Cisco or the small business type line. That can be a combination of router switch and access point. You can do like a medium tier grade, which will be again a dedicated access point. Um, or you can do again a router that has a controller card that supports both internal and external access points. So typically each access, each access point or AP, also known as a WAP, wireless access point, is configured and managed individually. Well, the problem with this is they're not converged, meaning if you go between both access points, they're not going to work together. They're not going to hand off uh, your sessions, and they just that's kind of bad. You have what's called a deployment solution, which is typically a cluster of, and that will be a converged network, meaning normally they're centrally managed, and they push the configuration from that centrally managed server. We also have a large wireless deployment, and that's going to be uh, for this uh, Marika cloud controller solution, 
which I've used their products before. They're pretty good. It's an online cloud solution and allows you to actually do a large deployment across like a casino or a stadium or a campus. Big thing here is understanding that these are larger access points. They can handle more things and you have both indoor and outdoor access points. Because again, if you want wireless in certain areas, you may have to do wireless outside controllers. Here we have a Cisco 1552, which is an outdoor rugged access point. It's made for the conditions to be outside. The issue with that is these guys are expensive. Here we have some controllers. So with the smaller software, with the smaller access points, you can actually do a cloud-based or software-based controller. As we start getting into more larger deployments, you have to have dedicated hardware, like a wireless controller, that runs the Cisco Service Ready Engine, SRE. Or you can have it pre-built into your router. But these items start getting more and more expensive. Essentially, they control the access points. So that we talked about certain standards, we talked about the controllers, let's talk about antennas. So we have three main types of antennas. We have an omnial directional, which means basically a giant sphere uh, or a bubble. We have a directional, which is more of a pointing, it goes a single direction, or we have a yagi. A yagi antenna is a type of directional, but it's made to channel more power in one direction for a little longer distances. So again, it's a directional antenna, but it's a special type of directional antenna. We have what's called an ad hoc mode. So that means there is no access point required. You can connect between two devices, um, like Apple's AirShare or the Android's, whatever they call it. I mean, most uh, wireless devices now have a way to quickly share files back and forth with each other without infrastructure. With an infrastructure, we have to have a wireless access point. So we also have what's called this thing called tethering. We have the ability to tether wirelessly between devices. For example, you can tether your laptop or your tablet to your mobile device. Your mobile device becomes the internet connection for the wireless device you're using. Within infrastructure mode, we have um, two different base stations, A and B. I'm not quite sure. Oh, here we're supposed to be discussing the basic service set summary. Basically, we have a BFID ID. Basic SID Service ID. Oh, I always forget that acronym. Basically, it's again the ability to communicate through a centralized device. You can build out the appropriate infrastructure. This is called the extended service set. All right, let's get into some more of our operations. This is more of the technical. Let's look at a frame. Here we have an 802.11 frame. Pretty similar to a LAN frame, except we have frame control duration, the appropriate sub addresses, sequence control, then we have the payload. Here's again the appropriate Wireshark capture of it. We have our frame control uh, subfields. So, what does that mean? Like, how does this differ from a regular Ethernet frame? Well, here under the frame control, we have a frame type. And we have the different types of frames, whether it be a management or a control frame or a data frame. So there's some things there. Also, we have the uh, frame subtypes. Again, depending on the appropriate hexadecimal number, this is the appropriate frame. Is it a beacon? Is it a disassociation? Is it a probe request? We also have a control frame. And again, that's going to be like request to send, clear to send, or the acknowledgements. Very similar to collision detection, 
but here we're using collision avoidance, so hence the it will check before it sends just to make sure. So we kept saying collision avoidance. Remember that's carrier sensing, media access, collision detection, and collision or carrier sensing, media access, collision avoidance. Wired uses CD, collision detection. Wireless uses collision avoidance. Here we have the appropriate flowchart, start, symbol the frame. Is there an idle channel? Assuming yes, transmit. Did it, was it received? If it was received, end. If no to these parts, again, it goes through its process. So there's typically a three-step phase for an association. When a wireless device first comes online, it will do a discovery of your access point. It will authenticate between the access point and itself, and then it will associate with that access point. This is part of the danger, is because once you've connected to a wireless device, it always is still in your list unless you manually remove them. So your wireless device is still sending out associated probes. Hey, are, are you here? Hey, are you here? If you've ever connected to a network. So you can actually have a rogue device pretend to be that legitimate device that you connected to once, and thus that association is then rebuilt. Though the reason for the association is let's say you go to Starbucks often, or you go home. Instead of having to rejoin your home network every day, it remembers your home network. So when you get home, that discovery will realize, oh, I already know this access point, and just go to the association. Again, that's where that bad portion does come back into play. Association parameters, normally the name or the SID, the password, the appropriate mode, meaning is it 802.11a, b, g, so forth. Is that password sending in the correct security mode? Is it WEP? Is it WPA2? Is it WPA1? Uh, also, is it on the appropriate channels? Because that's a big part. Because we're only supposed to use channels 1 through 12 in the United States, but more often than not, you're using channels 1, 6, and 11, so there is no overlap. All right, so what do I mean by overlap? One, six, and 11, they don't overlap with channels next to them. For example, one does not overlap with six. One does not overlap with 11, so forth. Where, if we did two, six, and 11, two overlaps with six, three overlaps, five overlaps. So one, six, and 11 does not overlap. We have two different ways to do discovery for access points. We have active and passive. Passive, the access point will advertise its uh, SID. But the interesting thing here is the beacon's primarily purpose is to allow wireless clients to learn. Active, you have the wireless client has to already know the name of the SID and then it connects. We also have a way to authenticate because again, part of that control frame is a authentication portion of the frame that will actually set up and authenticate between the sender and receiver using again, either an open authentication or a shared key authentication. Typically their first uh, frame that's sent is gonna be an open key, but, or it's gonna be an, an open type you could also send a secured key, but. So now that we've talked about channels, now that we talked about key exchange and antennas and frequencies, well, the important part is how does my device connect to my access point? And is there things that are out there that actually interfere with my device? Yes, there are. So we have what's called Frequency channel saturation for channel management. Basically, what that means is if we're communicating over channel six 
and channel six is over flooded with other things, can we change? Or originally my sending happened to be on channel one and at my primary location, channel one's not saturated, meaning not having a lot of people connected to it, but on my destination side, block away, 300 feet away, channel one, there's lots of noise. So how can we send on channel one if one side is free and one side has lots of noise? So that's where these channel management uh, items come into play. Direct sequence sp uh, spread spectrum, DSSS, uses a sped spectrum modulation technique designed to spread over all the larger frequencies, meaning it makes it more resistant to interference. We have a frequency hopping sp uh, spread spectrum, FHSS, and it relies on the sped spectrum method to communicate. It transmits radio signals by rapidly switching a carrier signal among all of the frequency channels. We have an orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Frequency division multiplexing is always a real fun one. It's a subset of frequency division multiplexing in which a single channel is utilized multiple subchannels on that adjacent frequencies. Because it uses subchannels, it's more efficient, and this is typically the method used by G, N, and AC. So how do we select the appropriate channels? Normally, we're looking at specific frequencies, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Again, 2.4 gigahertz is going to be in the ultra high frequency. The 5 gigahertz will be in the super high frequency or SHF. And then things like our AD, our newest standard, which I've not really seen cards out that support it yet, but they'll be coming soon. And that's going to be in the 60 gigahertz range. So that's going to be in the extremely high frequency range. We've already looked at this. We've looked at the channels. Uh, again, normally for a channel, it's 22 megahertz blocks. And again, we use channels 1, 6, and 11 because they're non-overlapping. See, when we select a channel, again, they're normally at a 20 to 22 megahertz chunk. We're not doing 22 megahertz because we want some gap in between them. So again, channels 1, 6, and 11. 13 and 14 exist, they're just not legally allowed to be used in the United States. So again, when we say channel 1, we're really using 2.412 gigahertz, or 2,412 megahertz. If we're using channel 6, it's 2,432 megahertz. If we're using the appropriate OFDM, their channels are using more of a 40 megahertz channel width. So here you're going to notice that we're going to have overlap if we use channels 1, 6, and 11. Because again, we're combining two of the 200 megahertz channels into one 400 megahertz channel. So again, that's why we have to know this. Realistically, most of the time this is left on auto by most people. But at least if you're understanding why some of this is there, you can make a more informed decision. Let's talk about wireless deployments. Where do you place your access points? You want appropriate coverage, one. Two, you're gonna have to do the research on the appropriate coverage for the access point that you have with some bleed over. But again, here, we have to make sure that we're staying on our appropriate channels. Trying to grab my pin. This may use channel 1, this may use channel 6, this may use channel 11. What does this one use? Well, this is connecting to a wireless network that has 1, or sorry, that has 6 and 11, so that one has to be channel 1. What if we do another access point here? Well, this one's connecting to 1 and 6, so this one needs to be 11. Just like if we do another one here, this will be connecting to 1 and 6, so this one needs to be 11. If we do another one up here, it's connecting the channels 11, 11, and 6, 
we need to have this one one and so forth and so forth again we're reusing channels 1 6 and 11 we just make sure that 1 6 and 11 don't touch a repeating number so now let's get into the LAN security. So with wireless threats, we have things like rogue access points, wireless intruders, the interception of that wireless data, and the possibility of a denial of service type attack. Denial of service, basically they inject so much BS in the frequencies that wireless no longer functions. You can also do things like spoof disc, uh, disconnect attacks or CTS type attacks. Again, these are going to be like clear to send frames where they just continuously keep sending and overwhelm access points because they're trying to send data when it's not clear to send. Also, you can do things such as reauthentication attacks where all you have to do is basically reassociate with an access point and that will basically drop all connections to that access point. But if you keep sending them over and over and over and over, the access point just keeps dropping them. Rogue access points is, again, this can cause a man in the middle of type attack. And that's where you think it's a legitimate access point. In reality, it's not. For a great example, you can think about Starbucks. You go to Starbucks, you connect with the Wi-Fi, all fine and dandy, or so you think. But in reality, you may be connecting to a pineapple that's connected to the starbucks network and the pineapple is actually then broadcasting starbucks network that way you connected the strongest signal which happens to be that pineapple thus funneling all your traffic through the pineapple a pineapple is a rogue access point device it does lots of other things but it also does rogue access points but basically it allows you to funnel all your traffic through them thus allowing to do a man in the middle attack or possibly do the man-in-the-middle attack. So a man-in-the-middle attack, what we were just discussing, it will act as an evil twin. Basically, it becomes a Starbucks network. You don't realize it's there, but it's an evil access point collecting all the data that you send through it. So we have two major types for wireless security. We have authentication, and that comes in two flavors, open or shared. The shared keys are preferable because open wireless, anyone can get on. Shared keys come in three major sets, WEP, WPA, and WPA2. The issue is WEP, there are plenty of ways to break into it. Well, WPA and WPA2 has been thought that's pretty secure, but in reality, neither of them are safe either. WPA and WPA2 is also easily broken into. It may take a day or two to actually break the shared key, but WPA2 is also susceptible. We were actually able to take a grandma who has never broken Wi-Fi and in 20 minutes give her the knowledge and steps required so that she could break wireless. So again, WEP, uh, it's obsolete. First generation, use RC4. WPA2 also uh, dealt with or worked with WEP and that was also using a a pre-shared key encryption or TKIP encryption. Typically, WPA2 is what you want. It uses AES encryption, but again, it's not, it's better than nothing, but it's not as secure as people think. So what is W or what is TKIP? What is AES? So TKIP is that temporary key integrate protocol. It's used by WEP, or sorry, WEP and W. PA. It was okay, but there were known vulnerabilities for it, made it easier to break into. AES is used by WPA2. It's a stronger method of encryption, but again, it's harder to break the encryption, but not impossible. So authenticating a home user typically comes in two flavors, because so WPA and WPA2 has two main flavors, personal and enterprise. Personal uses a pre-shared key, where Enterprise uses a Radius server. That's using that 802.1x standard, and that's sent through EAP, or Extendable Authentication Protocol. Typically, when you connect to like the school's wireless, and you have to type in your credentials, that's Radius, as opposed to you just typing in one wireless password and you gain access. Enterprise authentication allows you to 
Verify end users with Active Directory, for example. Authentication in the enterprise typically uses authentication, authorization, and accounting, triple A radius server, because again, that way we can verify that we're connecting. Let's talk lastly about wireless LAN configuration. So let's talk about configuring a wireless router first. Normally you wanna be able to document what you're doing. So things like what's the network name? Is it having multiple access names? Uh, passwords, things like that. So one thing that I do wanna point out is when you do this, you can have a access point that actually broadcasts multiple wireless networks because the access point can create what's called a virtual access point. What that means is you can have one access point, for example, broadcast for students, employees, staff, event. Even though it's one access point, it's actually doing that to four different wireless networks. So I did want to point that out because for some people, they get confused with that. So configuring a router, start with the wireless implementation process in a single uh, access point without any wireless security. Uh, gotta be careful with that. Once you receive a DHCP IP address, log into it, change it. Uh, again, WPA2 is what you want to be using. Here's a representation of it. If you're doing a Cisco a Linksys Soho router, it will give you software to install. That will let you access the device's web page. Basically, the IP address of this is your default gateway, and that will walk you through the configuration of setting everything up. Smart Wi-Fi settings. Basically, configure the router basic settings for your LAN, for your WAN, passwords, encryption type for wireless, and or if you have any DMZ or port forwarding needs that you may want to forward. For example, you may want to forward a specific IP to a specific device. For example, you may have an Xbox. You may want to forward those uh, ports that Xbox will use to a specific device, which will probably be actually your Xbox. Again, things like uh, device lists. You want to look through if there's media prioritization, if there is speed, white speed. That's always a good one because people don't think about when you do speed type tests, is it actually working the way it should be working? Backup and document. Connect the appropriate wireless devices. Troubleshooting, start with simple things. Can you connect to the device? Can other things connect to the uh, device? Divide and conquer. If you can connect, but your neighbor can't, okay, then it probably is not the wireless. So again, kind of break it up into smaller chunks and troubleshoot that way. We also have two types of um, approaches for troubleshooting, bottom up, layer one, layer seven, or layer seven, layer one. Both have benefits. For that, just kind of you gotta spend time practicing. Wireless devices that are not connecting, you're gonna have to look at the wireless access point, look at the wireless settings, make sure that the wireless is turned on, make sure they're both using the same channel, make sure they're using the same password. When you're talking troubleshooting, uh, if slow devices are there, is a mixed environment, both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, one, Two, are there other devices that are there? Are there too many devices that are connecting it? What version is the software? That's always a big one. All right, and actually that's the end of this chapter. We talked about a lot of information. Make sure that you understand the frequencies that traditional Wi-Fi operates, the channels, the names. Uh, make sure you understand uh, ad hoc and things of that nature. Make sure that you understand what CA and CD do, uh, does. 
make sure you understand, again, the vulnerability of the wireless. And if you have any questions, please let me know.